Easy, girl. Easy. <laughs> wow. Aren't we lucky to have heard that original recording of a man from Somerset grooming his horse in some stables in 1572. Captivating. Hello and welcome back to the final couplet with me, Theo Cowan. What a monumental episode we have today. The one everyone's been waiting for since the inception of this podcast many moons ago. Yes, that's right, it's Sonnet 18. We are leaving behind the saga of John and Shakespeare's wife and, and all of that, and and the sonnets about making young, hot men have kids. That's done. That's gone. Now we're into a new period of Shakespeare's sonnets, and this one today, I would say probably Shakespeare's most famous sonnet. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to stick my neck out and say, yeah, it's his most famous one. So buckle up and get ready to hear it be read by me. Now. Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Hell of a sonnet. Well done, Shakespeare. Do you think when he was writing that he thought this is probably the best one I'm going to do? I mean, definitely he thought this is the best one I've done yet. When you look at 1 through to 17, there's no there's no debate there, really. He must have gone, wow, maybe I should just scrap the first 17 and, and, and dive in with, with 18 being Sonnet 1 and just forget all the stuff about making hot guys have kids. But he didn't. And you know what? I respect that. I, I've always said keep in some of your weaker stuff to make the stronger material sound even better, I think. So when you surround Sonnet 18 with a load of with a load of crap, dare I say, Sonnet's 117, um, it makes 18 sound sound bloody brilliant. Now, let's work out what he's talking about in this, shall we? So we start with Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And that quite simply just means Shall I compare you to a summer day? A lovely, hot summer day. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. So you're actually nicer, you're lovelier than a summer's day. And um, I'm milder. Which I, I wonder is... Is that really a, a compliment? You're lovely and you're lovely and mild. You're a lovely mild person. I've always liked that about you. Anyway, then we go on to rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. So here he's saying, you know, rough winds shake all the the buds off the trees and plants in May. And summer just doesn't last long enough for me. 
I wish summer was just all year round. So they're saying, it's, you know, summer's too short. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. So sometimes the sun is too, is too hot, and and also often the sun's face gets gets obscured by clouds. It's overcast, and you you bloody know what that means if you live in England. <laughs> that's for sure. And every fair from fair, some time declines. Now I think that means. You know, every every fa- every th- every beautiful thing, everything that's beautiful, eventually stops being beautiful. That's just life, by chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. So, I think that's just a continuation. So beautiful, everything that's beautiful it eventually stops being beautiful. By chance, you know, by just chance or by nature, because nature's done it. So I imagine that just means, you know, when a when a flower dies, that's nature making something not beautiful, isn't it? Although some would say a, a dead flower is beautiful. Not for me to judge. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. So here he's bringing it back to the to the recipient of the poem. He's saying, but your eternal summer, which I've been talking about, summer, will never fade, actually. Nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. So, and you won't, you won't lose the possession of, of your beauty, of of your looks. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade. So here I think he's saying, nor shall, you know, death talk about how you're wandering in, you know, you're, you're, you're wandering about, but you're always in his, in his shade, you know, or you're always close to death, you know, eventually you will die. He's not bragging about that. He's not saying that about you, but he says that about everyone else. When in eternal lines to time thou growest. Now here I think, you know, we've had this crop up in in a few of his previous poems, but I think here he's saying, you know, none of this will happen to you when you are captured and written written about in, in my sonnets, in my Shakespeare's sonnets. Uh, bigging himself up again. And now we're on to the final couplet. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. So here he's just saying, you know, as long as men are alive and and, and can still have and still have vision, uh, then this poem will live on and keep you alive in everyone's minds because because look at us, you know, we're reading this 500 years later and the recipient of this poem at the time, you know, we're still talking about them. So we are remembering them. So it's actually worked, his poem. Wouldn't have worked probably if the poem got lost or or burnt or something, just wouldn't work because we'd never read it. So, but luckily it worked out for him. So well done. And that's that. And it's a nice one. I'd say it's nice the the comparison summer and and this person. I think he does sort of he does big his own writing up a little bit. I'd say you know he he he's com- doing the comparison with with summer and it's lovely saying how how lovely this person is and then he's like oh and also by the way I've written this so that you can live on which I guess is nice but it's also saying I'm I'm a pretty good writer so Enjoy. Lucky you. Now, we've come to the point in the podcast where I make a little story up about, you know, a situation we might we might hear this this sonnet in. 
obviously we wrapped up the last story so this will either be a self-contained little sonnet or we might have some more sonnets along the same theme which 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 means that we'll we'll continue this on in future weeks i don't know we'll see what happens and you know we might bring in some some old favorite characters from past episodes we'll see don't get too excited we'll see right let's find out in what crazy situation Shakespeare read this sonnet. The year is 1500 and whenever Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet. Shakespeare finishes writing his hit play, Romeo and Juliet. Of course, he doesn't know it's going to be a hit yet. He just thinks he's written a little romantic ditty. He puts his quill down, gathers up the paper, and takes it down to Fleet Street, where his producer lives. He knocks on the door. His producer, Philip, opens the door. He says, ah... Shakespeare, I've been waiting for you. I hear you've got a new play. And Shakespeare says, absolutely I do. Tis called Romeo and Juliet. And Philip says, well, 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 what a title. I love it, Shakespeare. I can tell right now it's going to be a hit. Now, who do you want to cast in the lead roles of Romeo and Juliet? And Shakespeare says, well, I think we should hold a casting session where I sit in a room at the Globe Theatre, where we will put this on, and we get some people to come in and, and read for the roles. What do you think? And Philip says, well, I think that's an absolutely marvellous idea, Shakespeare. I am behind you on this 100%. So, Shakespeare leaves the play with Philip to read overnight so that he can get an idea of the cast and whatnot. Two weeks later, Philip and Shakespeare are sat in a room at Shakespeare's Globe. It wasn't called Shakespeare's Globe then, it was called The Globe. Shakespeare hadn't laid claim to it, you see. And there's a snake of people waiting outside the room, all anxiously looking to audition for Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. You know, there's people from all walks of life. There's there's peasants, there's down and outs, there's royals. Some royals are there looking to audition for the role of either Romeo or Juliet. And dignitary, dignitary, lots of them. There's all sorts. And... They've had a hell of a morning, Shakespeare and Philip, trying to cast these roles. They've seen some real shockers, some terrible actors. And just as they're losing hope, an actor comes in to read for the role of Romeo. He's not the best looking guy in the world, but by God does he give a good reading. He really has researched the role of Romeo so well. He knows it back to front. He leaves the room and Philip and Shakespeare go, well, I mean, that's him, isn't it? That's him. That's our Romeo. And they high five and then shake hands and then fist bump and do a little with their fingers in celebration. And Philip says, well, I mean, I don't think we need to see anyone else. Shakespeare, what do you think? And Shakespeare says, no, probably not. Should we just see who the next person is? 
and there's a knock on the door. It's the next auditionee. And they walk in and good God, are they good looking. His name is David. He has shocking blue eyes, lovely, long, blonde hair tied up into a bun, rippling pecs and a six pack you could you could open a bottle on. Shakespeare looks at Philip. Philip looks at Shakespeare. Their mouths are wide open and they say, well, uh, hello, uh, 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 David, uh, please um, give a reading of uh, Romeo and Juliet. Thanks so much for coming. And David reads the part of Romeo and he is absolutely terrible. He's an awful actor. It's almost as if he's never even spoken before. He's so bad. And he says at the end of his audition, right, thanks for thanks for hearing me out. I'll uh, see you soon, uh, hopefully. And he leaves the room and Shakespeare says, wow, he is good, isn't he? He's very good. And Philip says, well, I think no, actually. He was pretty terrible. And Shakespeare says, I think that's the Romeo. I think that's him. And Philip says, you have lost your mind, Shakespeare. That was the worst reading I've ever heard. And Shakespeare says, look, I want him to play Romeo. So he will play Romeo. And Philip, knowing he can't say anything back to that, just nods in agreement. A few weeks pass and Shakespeare is directing Romeo and Juliet now because he just wants to get close to David. He doesn't really care about anyone else in the cast and he only works on David's speeches and scenes. At the end of one of their rehearsals, Shakespeare says, Oh, David, can you stay behind, please? And David says, "Uh, of course, Shakespeare. Is there anything you want to talk about? And Shakespeare says, have you seen the globe by moonlight? And David says, I I haven't. I've, I've actually never been to the globe. And Shakespeare says, what? You've never been to the globe? <laughs> well, come with me. And they walk along the bank of the Thames to the globe. Shakespeare says, I've got the keys to this place, you see. It'll be called Shakespeare's Globe one of these days. And David says, wow, okay, that's amazing. Let's go inside. And they walk inside the Globe Theatre. And it's beautiful. The moonlight shines down on the stage as Shakespeare jumps up onto it. He says, David, I've been wanting to read you a little poem that I've written. And David says, oh, wow, what a privilege to hear a a poem written by Shakespeare. And Shakespeare says, I know, I know. And you know what's even more remarkable is I wrote this for you. And David can't believe what he's hearing. The William Shakespeare has written him a poem. And Shakespeare says, you don't mind if I get it out and read it, do you? And David says, of course not. What a privilege. They look into each other's eyes. As Shakespeare removes Sonnet 18 from his back pocket. He clears his throat and says, Sonnet 18. And David says, what? Sonnet 18? And Shakespeare says, don't worry about the number. It's just, it's just, it is but a number. He says, don't interrupt me again, for God's sake. Let me just read the poem. And he clears his throat again and reads. Sonnet 18. 
routine. Shall I compare you to a summer day? You're lovelier and milder. Rough winds shake the buds of May, and summer doesn't last anywhere near long enough. Sometimes the sun's too hot, and often his gold face is dimmed by clouds, and everything beautiful becomes ugly, by chance or through nature's course. But your eternal summer will never fade, nor will you lose possession of your beauty, nor shall death brag about your walking about in his shadow once you're captured in my poems. As long as men stay alive and have eyes they can see with, this poem will give you eternal life. Well, well, well. Hell of an episode, hell of a story. And I think, I think that story is based on truth. I'm not, don't hold me to that, but I think the story you just heard is almost certainly a real story about Shakespeare. So, I mean, you should be honoured. And I, for one, hope that we hear more uh, from Shakespeare and David and the creation of Romeo and Juliet, and and I feel like we will. I feel like we'll come back to them at some point. But, until next week, 